Okay, BGP is the border gateway protocol. And it's, in, it's a routing protocol that evolved in the internet. And it's, you can think of it as kind of the, the top of the food chain in terms of routing in the internet. It's the, it's the protocol that's used to connect the uh, service providers, let's say, primarily in the internet. So how does AT&T exchange uh, reachability information with BT, with France Telecom, with, you know, and they have to exchange uh, this kind of reachability information so that we can glue the, these uh, uh, autonomous networks together because there is no one, there is no centralized control in the internet. You know, so BT uh, controls its equipment and its part of the internet, but AT&T controls its part of the, uh, its own part of the internet, and they have to interoperate somehow. They have to be able to uh, exchange information about uh, the IP addresses associated with their customers, etc. So the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, is this protocol that has evolved to handle that job, right? To exchange uh, information between autonomous networks, okay? So without any centralized control. There are many en interesting engineering problems there, uh, interesting research problems in terms of scalability and robustness, et cetera. Uh, and, but I'm gonna talk about it in really sort of elementary terms. And I want to, I want to be, I want to talk about a, a simple graph problem, a sort of reachability problem in graphs, in simple combinatorial graphs with, where we have nodes and arcs and we want to get from one place to another. You send a, a packet to your service provider, it has to look in a table and figure out where to send that next. And that packet may end up on the other side of the globe in a, in a completely different network. Uh, and, and so it's that level, you know, it's, it's uh, how to get from here to there. So it's the foundations of yeah. the internet. It's the basic global foundation of the internet. Different protocols are used within these autonomous networks. And I think more talked about that in a previous computer file. And, you know, for example, you might use some kind of shortest path based thing within a network. But between networks, what's interesting about this is that, you know, we want this uh, interdomain, I'll call these domains or, or you know, uh, regional uh, autonomous networks. We want this uh, routing to interoperate, to work, w w even when uh, the service providers don't have common agreement about what is the best route, for example. You know, your best route might not look like my best route because we have different contracts with, with different companies in the internet, and so we have different, we will have different uh, ideas about what is best. Okay. So that might be a commercial thing. It might be, I, I, you know, I don't want you to send too much traffic through me because it's going to cost me money to run. That's it. right, right. And basically, the idea is that um, when you're doing shortest path routing, you, you, want, you, know, you want everybody to be connected with everybody and along the shortest path. And in the internet, you, want, um, you don't want traffic to be crossing your network unless somebody's paying you for that, either the source of the traffic or the destination or a or, or combination, right? Somehow, and so in other words, uh, the protocol is more about limiting the connectivity rather than uh, you know, being generous about it and giving it to everyone. It's kind of let's restrict this connectivity to uh, those that are paying for it somehow. That's basically the idea. But what I, wa what I want to think about is well, how does this fit into our notion of finding paths in a graph? Because in, in uh, undergraduate uh, computer science, one of the things we teach in algorithms courses is, is you know, a lot of shortest path algorithms. So we, we define a, a graph, let's say, uh, that is nodes and arcs, and you have a weight on these arcs, and then you try to find the best paths between every pair of arcs, let's say. And we, we typically teach this and we teach lots of algorithms for doing this, like Dijkstra's algorithm, Bellman Ford, uh, Warshall's algorithm. So can we abstract away from the complexities of BGP and think about it in those terms? The thing is, it, it doesn't quite fit in our models very well. And, and, uh, and I'll try to explain 
informally, why not? What, what doesn't fit? The, the BGP or what doesn't fit? Okay, so we normally think about shortest path in terms of numeric values. Okay, so, and we typically add those values as we go along a path, right? So maybe, maybe each arc has a weight one. And we essentially count the number of hops that we're going through a path, and then we would prefer, let's say, a shorter path, one with fewer hops, than a longer one. So we're, what we're using there are two operations, plus, and maybe an operation, let's call it min. Okay? So we have these operations, min and plus. So min for minimum, yeah. plus for adding up those hops, yeah? Right. And so what people noticed that about 40 years ago, is that a lot of these algorithms that we have uh, for shortest paths, Dijkstra's algorithm, Bellman Ford, can be generalized to a large class of algebraic structures called semi-rings. I'm, I'm going to ask you what is a really stupid question now, I'm sure. Okay. Semi-ring. I'm yeah. not familiar with a semi-ring. Okay, so a semi-ring is a algebraic structure that looks like a ring. So what is a ring? A ring is something like the real numbers. So we have a domain, the real numbers, and we have a plus and a times. They are plus and times the, the uh, standard operations. Um, and uh, linear algebra is built on rings, right? We, we take matrices, we multiply matrices, we solve matrix equations, things like that. That's all linear algebra. Well, it turns out that semi-rings and routing is also, it's kind, it's kind of like a generalization of that, where we, we weaken the properties that uh, the, the plus and the times have to have, right? Uh, so, for example, a ring um, uh, that plus has inverses. We have negative numbers, so there's always a, for every a, there's a, not, there's a negative a that when you add them together, you get zero. Okay, and a semi-ring is like a ring, except it doesn't have that inverse property. You don't necessarily have inverses. What people did back in the 60s and 70s is they looked at algorithms like Dijkstra's algorithm, like um, Bellman Ford, and then they said, wait a minute, let's work backwards. Let's look at these. We see min and plus in the algorithms, but let's replace them by abstract operators. And let's see what algebraic properties we need to make this algorithm work still. Suppose we want to pick paths that have the highest capacity, okay? So we might, instead of using plus, we might go along a path using min. The weight of a path will be the minimum capacity link. And then instead of using min to compare paths, we might want to use max. So that would give us the highest capacity path. Okay, so people noticed, oh, wait a minute, you know, this min plus and this max min, they have certain algebraic properties that are true. And we can, we can take Dijkstra's algorithm and we can replace the plus with min and replace the min with max. And now we have an algorithm that does, it works perfectly fine. Now it, now it finds the highest capacity paths in the graph. And then we can build other things. For example, suppose I wanted to find paths that were shortest, but if I had two paths that were equally short, maybe I want to break ties with capacity. Okay, so then now I could have a path with two metrics, you know, distance, capacity, right? And then I could essentially, uh, you know, use shortest paths on that first component and then break ties with capacity. Okay, that too, that, that, that turns out you can make a semi-ring out of this, and then guess what? You can use Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, Bellman Ford, to compute with these as well. If you compare things, you know, first distance, then capacity, kind of a, it's kind of a lexicographic comparison there. You can build a semi-ring out of that, and then, and so, so these, these algorithms are really generic. You can just plug in, uh, you can plug in, uh, uh, you know, just an unbounded uh, number of, of different algebraic structures to get what you want and use the same algorithms, Bellman Ford or Dijkstra, etc. So this might seem like, oh, now we have this open-ended world. Uh, maybe we can model something like BGP in this world. Turns out we can't, okay? And, and let me give you an example of, of it that's easy, easier to understand than BGP, okay? I told you we could do uh, 
we could, we could look at distance first, then break ties with bandwidth. Suppose we, or capacity. Let's suppose we did it the other way around. I want the highest capacity paths, and if I have two capa uh, uh, best paths uh, with high capacity, I want to break ties then on the distance. So I first look at the, at the capacity component, then I break ties on distance. That's not a semi-ring anymore. Why is that? Oh, it's not obvious that, you know, if you use some of these uh, generic uh, uh, best path algorithms, it's something's going to break, maybe. Why is that? Not obvious, but it turns out that one of the rules of, uh, that needs to be followed by a semi-ring is something called distribu distributivity. This is an algebraic property. What it really means is that, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter if I make a decision about the best paths, seeing all my paths, or you, my neighbor, you make the decisions and you tell me what your best path is. It kind of doesn't really matter. Because we'll come to the same conclusion. We'll come to the same conclusion, right? So that's what distributivity is all about. And this, this thing I told you about, you know, shortest path, then capacity, that has that property still. But when I turn it around, when I do capacity first, and then shortest paths, it breaks that property. Okay, and let me just give you an example of why. Suppose I have a neighbor that sees two paths, one's very high bandwidth, but also a very long path, right? And it sees another one with very low bandwidth or capacity, but it has a short path. And then I am talking to my neighbor over a very low capacity link. So my neighbor picks that high capacity, long path, but I see two paths and I say, wait a minute, this is kind of like a bottleneck link. I, it sort of wipes out the, the capacity, you know, it's the, the capacity of both paths is now the capacity of this really lousy link. As far as I'm concerned, both of those paths that my neighbor is giving me have the same capacity because I have this bottleneck link with very low capacity. So I'm going to break ties on the length, right? I'm going to break ties, I'm going to want that shortest path. But my neighbor picked the longer path because it had higher capacity, but I don't see that, you see. So we're going to be disagreeing about this, okay? So a similar thing happens in the internet, for example, if I'm a paying customer of a route, of a, of a path, let's say, I'm paying upstream, I'm paying for this route, but my neighbor is a service provider, one of those paths it's not paying for because it's, a, it's their customer, another path it's paying for, you know, it's up, it has an upstream provider, so that, that, that path could be, my neighbor would like the longer path because it's a, from a paying customer. From an economic point of view, they like that longer path. Uh, but I, I see the two routes as, well, they're both provider paths. They're both equally bad in that sense. So I'll pick the shorter one. So we don't agree. There's one thing I should say about internet routing that I was, I've been sort of taking for granted without really making it explicit. And that is 99% of internet routing protocols only, uh, they, they, they're, they're traffic insensitive, okay? That is, they're perfectly willing to route all the traffic along the most congested link in the internet, okay? In other words, they don't route around congestion. Ah, so this is the traffic difference between, right. the, yeah. And so telco protocols routed around things like congestion, but internet protocols have tradition, there are a few exceptions, but generally protocols like BGP, OSPF, ISIS, and, and RIP do not route around congestion. That's considered sort of a network, that's at, done at network management time scales. So a network manager will see, oh, we have congestion over there, let's adjust the link weights so that the traffic will be spread out more or diverted. The protocol doesn't do that. The protocol just blindly follows those link weights, those statically configured link weights. Um, it's not sensitive to traffic uh, characteristics. And this is because in the internet, those characteristics tend to change a lot and oscillate a lot. And they tend to often oscillate in a, at, a, at a faster rate than the control plane can keep up with. 
And so you, you, when you try to adapt um, dynamically to congestion, you tend to introduce a lot of instability in the routing plane. And so these things are, you know, completely insensitive to, um, to uh, traffic conditions like congestion. It's up to the network managers to set those statically configured link weights to avoid congestion. So, so this is more like the road signs. They tell you where those things go, yes. but they don't change. Yes. I think internet forwarding is a lot like those signs that just point you in that direction. You know, Paris is in that direction. Go, if you're heading towards Paris, go that way. A complicated thing, of course, is that when we have now these regions that are divided up uh, into autonomous regions that have very different goals, uh, but they're forced to interact, right? BT is forced to exchange routes with AT&T because they're selling the service of global internet connectivity. So they're forced to interact with their competitors. They'd, they'd like to control the entire internet, I'm sure, but they can't. There's a balance. You, you want to allow each network to tailor its, let's call them routing policies or routing policies. Sorry, I've been in the UK for 12 years, so I'm saying routing now. 